Wherever humans have roamed, mice and rats have followed us. While traveling, humans brought their chickens, cows, dogs, and sheep on purpose. Rats and mice followed us of their own volition. Arguably no other group of animals has adopted our urban habitats without our permission, more so than rats and mice. Their proliferation and near ubiquity dates back before civilization. Being small creatures with very little self-defense mechanisms, these creatures focus their efforts on producing plenty of rapidly growing offspring in a short period of time. With lifespans that amount to a year or two, these creatures breed a lot, produce a lot of offspring, and those offspring become sexually mature very quickly. On top of that, they can hide in nooks and crannies, and they'll eat almost anything. All these characteristics would make them suitable for an environment set up by an African ape that ditched hunting and gathering for settling down in villages, many of which became cities. These cities would have plenty of nooks and crannies for the rats and mice to hide, breed and give birth, and these humans would produce a surplus of food, namely grain, that would be stored. This period of time was known as the Neolithic Age, the end point of the Stone Age, and the beginning of the Agricultural Revolution. Rats and mice have a keen sense of smell which help them locate food, and their nocturnal habits help them avoid human detection. Certain species of rats and mice would find their home in human settlements, oftentimes at the expense of humans who didn't like them eating grain, spreading disease, and shitting everywhere. A typical rat shits around 40 pellets per day. They are turd factories, and it isn't a surprise that early humans welcomed the African wildcats into their villages to hunt them, thus leading to the self-domestication of the cat. The amount of havoc that these tiny little creatures manage to pull off without any venom, poison, sharp claws, or sharp teeth is pretty remarkable. Some cultures even incorporated mice and rats into their diet, namely in parts of Southeast Asia and Southern Africa. However, this is highly taboo in most cultures. As humans left hunting and gathering for farming, as their cities became bigger and trade networks grew, mice and rats followed. The most noticeable example of this was via the bubonic plague during the Middle Ages of the 1300s AD. There is still some debate regarding how the plague spread, but the most well-known hypothesis involves the Oriental Rat Flea, a flea that carries a bacteria that targets the lymphatic system, leading to swollen lymph nodes, which carry white blood cells needed to protect your body from pathogens, the exact part of your body that would be very opportunistic for a set of pathogens that want to kill you, or more accurately, want to thrive in your body. These bacterium were basically situated on the oriental rat fleas, which were most likely carried by, well, rats. Rats from Central Asia, as mice and rats traveled alongside Mongol armies, as well as various merchants and tradesmen. These rats spread by foot, caravan, and ship across much of the Middle East, North Africa, and Europe, spreading the Black Death, arguably the worst pandemic in human history. At the time, people blamed everything from demons to God's wrath to the Jews and anything else, as this was before germ theory. People didn't know who was carrying the pathogens around or really what pathogens were in the first place. While knowledge of microorganisms spreading disease through carriers like rats was beyond science at that point, people did associate rats and mice with disgust. After all, the emotion of disgust is meant to prevent you from getting sick. Rats and mice would eventually spread to virtually every corner of the terrestrial Earth, except the coldest of polar regions. By hopping on European ships, they found their way to the Americas and Oceania. To this day, the Canadian province of Alberta is the only place in the world outside of the polar circles that do not have rats due to vigilant anti-rat policy. However, while causing mass death and destruction to various human populations, these creatures would eventually end up saving millions upon millions of human lives with the sacrifice of their own lives. With the advent of the scientific revolution during the 1600s to 1700s, as well as the discovery of natural selection and genetics, Scientists took notice of how studying these small mammals could be useful in a widespread manner by the 1800s. 
House mice and the brown rat would become the dominant model organisms for scientific research. Rats and mice can be kept socially in small cages, breed easily, and their anatomy and physiology, while not exactly the same as humans, obviously, are not completely different, and as a result, they became ideal creatures for medical testing. Or maybe not as ideal <laughs> as I implied, as we're going to see, but certainly better than most. Mice in particular have been subject to mutant strains, such as those which will develop a knockout gene in which one of their genes can't function. Scientists study this to find a way in which certain gene traits can lead to diseases and debilitating illnesses. Other examples include transgenic mice, in which a gene from a different organism is inputted. There are other examples including glow-in-the-dark mice. To this day, mice tend to be the most popular model organism for medical studies, while rats, due to their higher cognitive abilities, dominance, and flexibility tend to be more popular in psychological studies. However, there has been a recurring issue with using them for tests. For one, they're obviously different animals, with different anatomies and physiologies. For a variety of very complex and convoluted reasons, studies done on mice in particular for, say, diabetes and Parkinson's disease, among others, have been called into question. Another factor is that lab cages provide a different environment to the wilds in which rats and mice are rather used to. While laboratory environments are very good at controlling variables, it can also make mice and rats prone to obesity, which in turn causes a myriad of health problems since the rats and mice have less room to move around and they have easier access to food. One recurring issue with using rats and mice in animal testing is inbreeding, which has resulted in less genetic diversity. And of course, there are ethical concerns as well. Nonetheless, Mice and rats have saved countless lives, and testing on them has been instrumental for researching and eventually treating leukemia, epilepsy, the flu, among many, many others. In Russia, there's even a monument to the laboratory mouse, an homage to the mice and rats which were sacrificed for our own human lives. Hopefully one day, with emerging medical technology and better methodologies, their further sacrifices will no longer be needed. However many human lives they've contributed to the ends of, they have probably prolonged so many more. Thanks for watching.